Hello, everybody. Happy Wednesday. Happy Juneteenth. This is the Juneteenth special. How Lieutenant Colonel Abigail Curtis is leveraging our diverse perspectives to maintain our nation's unparalleled defense. Now, this is a co-led discussion as the talk with Abigail Curtis is based off of her incredible article that she released through the legendary Come Unity magazine. I'm going to leave an article link in the description so you can read all about her and see this absolutely stunning magazine uh, story that they did with, with Abigail. you got to check it out. I did get to talk with Abigail when I saw my best friend, uh, Master Sergeant Ronnie DeShanes, retire a few months back. Uh, anyone who's friends with me saw the photos. So not only did I get to see my best friend retire, but I got a tour of Washington State um, did some hikes. It was absolutely stunning, especially coming from Florida where it was super hot and humid. But while I was there, I also got to meet his phenomenal maintenance commander, Lieutenant Colonel Abigail Curtis, who is just an incredible person. Um, she kind of reminds me of a really sharp med group officer, but she's in maintenance. But her approachability, the talents that she brings, the uniqueness is really nothing I've ever seen when I used to be in maintenance. I think it's it's next level, it's unparalleled, and she's an absolute game changer. I brought all my equipment with me just to have this interview with her, and I'm going to pair it with her magazine article about Juneteenth, about her unique background being half Korean and half African American. Not only was that different growing up, for her personally because you know she had Korean food had all sorts of different stories from both sides of her families where no one really looked like her or had the same upbringing as her it was so unique to her was uh, one of the highlights of my trip out there to Fairchild really phenomenal person the magazine article on come unity magazine uh, it's a play off the word community genius title uh, that's read by CEO Kitara Johnson, who also has a podcast. Two podcasters, two veterans helping each other promote this positive message. So my podcast episode directly pairs with the magazine article link that I'll leave in the description. Make sure you check that out. Lieutenant Colonel Abigail S. Curtis stands as a beacon of inspiration within the halls of Fairchild Air Force Base. Serving as the distinguished commander of the 92nd Maintenance Squadron, her remarkable journey is not just about rank and accolades, but a testament to the enduring values of diversity, inclusion, resilience, and leadership. Now join us as we delve into her story, exploring the trials and triumphs that have shaped her into the exemplary leader that she is today. From her humble beginnings as a military child to her current role as squadron commander, she has defied expectations and shattered stereotypes at every turn and opportunity. Now, as we reflect on our story, let us not only celebrate her achievements, but also heed these lessons that she imparts on from her unique perspective and upbringing. For in Lieutenant Colonel Curtis's journey, we find inspiration and hope for a future where diversity is not just embraced, but it's celebrated, it's leveraged, and it's where resiliency knows no bounds. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the hero's journey of Lieutenant Colonel Abigail Curtis. This is a personal conversation between friends and is not represented by Fairchild Air Force Base or the Air Force as a whole. This is just two friends having a great discussion to hopefully inspire you or educate you. Let's get after it. So today's a very special day. Um, I'm at Fairchild. I, I usually can't say that, right? I'm always at Eglin. Uh, and I've never been to Washington State in my life. And I'm here to celebrate the retirement of my best friend, Ronnie DeShanes, uh, known him for 20 years since basic. And you were the presiding official, the officer over the ceremony. So today's an amazing day. Yep. You know, it was a lot of laughs some tears it kind of had all the the hallmarks of like a good retirement mm -hmm. you know what i mean yep um and i just want to start by thanking you for caring so much to make it a special day for ronnie so just want to start right out the gate just saying you're a badass and thank you for i helping. appreciate that so much this is the stuff that we have to get right and it's the stuff that matters and 
um, making sure we send him off knowing how appreciative we are of all of his service and the sacrifice of him and his family. So I'm, I'm just happy to be a part of it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you only get one shot at it. Yes. <laughs> you know we have I mean? to do it right. Yeah. You yeah. just, you got to do it that first try. Um, so I can't wait to like get out there and see, uh, the state like this is I, as i was flying in i was like this place looks crazy Washington well, state is beautiful yeah and yep. you know i'm coming from the beach so yeah it's i actually really cool. grew up on the west side and i grew up in tacoma washington uh, my dad was in the army he served for 22 years and that's how we ended up in washington state mm. because originally he's from arkansas and my mom is from korea they met when he was stationed in korea um, so I pretty much spent a majority of my childhood growing up there with a few moves that, you know, the Army kind of dictated, as you know. Um, at this point in my career, my life, I'm a mother of two, and my husband's also serving. He is a Army doctor at um, Lewis McCord, so oh, wow. he lives about five hours away um, oh, at the geez. other Air Force Base in Washington State. Wow. Um, yep. So we're doing a little bit of the long distance thing right. as a joint spouse couple. Um, the kids are with me and my parents are actually here with me helping to support just the demands of motherhood and command and all that comes with it. Um, but I've been in the Air Force for 16 years now. Most of those assignments have been something in maintenance, um, whether it was supporting C-130s, F-15s, C-17s. And then I spent some time also working more policy um, level actions, tasks, what, what you'd call it, um, either in the Pentagon or in D.C. working on Capitol Hill as a legislative fellow. So a lot of different varying experiences um worked with a lot of different people from all walks of life and um i came here in june 2022 to take command of the 92nd maintenance squadron as you know where ronnie's been working the past right. few years as well yeah and, yeah and he had nothing but great things to say about you um i mean there's certain folks that come through that just aren't really memorable in your life you know mm -hmm. they just weren't really present um yeah and it, it seemed like the total opposite you know, for you, mm -hmm. um, I think you just have that, you know, you're, you have that approachability. Um, yeah. and you know, I used to be maintenance to talk to an officer was like crazy town. Like now I'm medical. So obviously that's like every day. Yeah. But when I was maintenance, like that was wild. Like, Whoa, I'm not talking to them. Like, that, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah. um, with that culture in mind, it's cause there's so few of you. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. but with that in mind, I think it's so important to you know, be approachable. Mm -hmm. So they, they're like, Oh, I can't actually like talk to that person. Yeah. And I think you're absolutely crushing that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes. And uh, everyone seems to be just super drawn to you and you have a great energy and uh, they trust you. And yeah. so I know squadron uh, commander, any command position is like some of the hardest jobs mm -hmm. out there. Yeah. Um, because of the, the weight of the responsibility is tremendous. Mm -hmm. um, so Thank you for kicking ass for us. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's, and it's I don't nice get to talk to, to line side officers often yeah. either, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, I know when I first came into the Air Force, specifically the maintenance career field, those were probably some of my hardest days. Um, you know how maintenance can be like, eat your own. <laughs> it can be tough. Um, it can be very, very yeah. tough. But as lieutenant, I knew that. I brought something different to our career field and I brought something our community needed. And that was like compassionate leadership, empathetic leadership, leadership that cares, mm -hmm. um, leadership that values their people. And so at that point as Lieutenant, I, I made a commitment that I'm not going to change who I am. Well, wow, that's, you did that at Lieutenant. I, I did, did that. At, like, I was like, I did that at Master Sergeant. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like, I'm glad it clicked for you early. It clicked. And yeah. I, I, I smile a lot. I bring a different energy. I'm, I can be super enthusiastic, sometimes bubbly. and But that's kind of the core of who I am. And when I looked around the room, mm -hmm. I only saw one of me. And I, I was not, I wasn't going to conform. You know, I wanted right. to show that you can be a strong, effective leader mm -hmm. without having to change who you are. Right. Yeah. You can embrace who you are. Yeah. Yeah, trying to... Be and you can be effective and approachable, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of fear with vulnerability. That's why I feel like the the most 
that leader that's always like, oh, that's the hard ass. That's the, I feel like that's the actually the easier way out. Right? I agree. Yeah. Because you're not vulnerable on any nope. level. You're nope. just putting up barriers and walls. Yep. So it's like on the outside, you're like, oh, that's a, a tough leader. Mm -hmm. But it's, they actually might be afraid. Yep. You know, of folks getting to know them. Yeah. So uh, I admire you for that. Um, yeah, I was in like probably, I've been in 19 years now, but it was probably around my, I'd say 12 year mark when I really started embracing that concept. Mm -hmm. You know, I spent many years like, trying to emulate people I just wasn't yeah and that's just downright painful it is yeah it's it's depressing it's painful and you start to lose respect for yourself because mm -hmm. if you know if you don't want to be you then what's what are you doing here yep you know so uh I really admire that you know you kind of had a fight or flight moment it sounds mm -hmm. like and you chose to fight yeah I think a lot of it had to do with my upbringing um I grew up with my dad African American, my mother Korean, raised in a very multicultural, uh, multiracial homes where we did things, celebrated things, had different expectations because of that than a lot of the other people I grew up with. Um, and I'm talking about like grade school, like peers, other students mm -hmm. who didn't understand why my lunch looked different, for example. That's a very simple example. Right. Um, and so I think that at a young age, I, I learned that sometimes people are going to um, be just outright prejudiced or, you know, subtly exclude you because you're different. Um, so I can either go different paths with that. I can change who I am and conform. Or I can look at life in a different lens and understand, like, the strains um, the different perspective I bring Absolutely. and take pride in where I come from and who I am. So I think at a young age, I, I knew it's better to just be me than to try to be someone I'm not, you know? Yeah. No, that's, that's yep. beautiful. That's music to my ears. <laughs> um, but we're going to get, I'm going to hit you some random questions. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, we'll try to do an easier first question here. Leaders or readers, you know, what book, would you recommend, you know, maybe a new lieutenant coming up trying to, you know, broaden their awareness on leadership mm -hmm. or what what have you? You know, is there any particular book that comes to mind? I love Kim Scott's Radical Candor book. I've never heard of that. It is it's so good because it focuses on that right balance of leaders, uh, people in a position of authority, having that vulnerability and transparency. It's a right balance of it. Like you can't do too much, but mm -hmm. you don't want to do too little of it. So she talks about like those um, soft skills. I've been hearing that term a lot it's, lately. It's so good. She talks about um, using those soft skills and how that's how you build trust. That's how you unite a team. That's how you build connectedness. And once you have that, that's where you can be productive. You can set goals together. You can go after the same things. I just call that skills. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I keep hearing skills soft too. skills. I'm like, yeah. well, that's all I have. So yeah. to me, I'm just hearing the word skills. Yeah. Um, but uh, just like the title, Radical Candor, it's about cool having those tough conversations, yeah. even though it might make you uncomfortable or it might, you know, expose a vulnerable side of you. Right. Um, and the, the real world affects the, the Air Force. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And to pretend that it doesn't, you're just lying to yourself. Yeah. But, um, you know, we're still Americans living in America. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, I've seen some folks try to, you know, turn their back on tough talks because mm -hmm. it is uncomfortable for them. And um, that doesn't help anything, especially when real world events are kind of bleeding into your work center. Yeah. And I think the more we, we teach leaders how to to be uncomfortable mm -hmm. like it, it's better to to try and fail than to not try at all it's kind of yep. it kind of reminds me of that yeah right it, and maybe it's not even like you talking maybe it's just saying i want to talk about this and hear your thoughts on it and then you just listen yep it could maybe it's just that maybe you don't have to say anything mm -hmm. maybe you just need to listen well i think what's important too is like once people know your heart mm -hmm. and that you're trying to get after something good um, with integrity and with character mm -hmm. and you're asking them to trust you, they're way more likely to trust you. Right. Um, I think you can move more mountains once you build that relationship 
and Absolutely. and you sh- you show them like here's a part of me you have it now I'm vulnerable, but no that means like I'm I really believe in this thing and mm-hmm. I need your help. Right. I think you're you're more likely to get people on board because they know like if it fails, it didn't fail because um, your heart wasn't in it. You know. Right. So we value relationships in the military like I think way more um, because the the we're we're kind of always in a sprint. Mm-hmm. Because you're not here forever. Yep. Right? And that, that puts you in a different headspace, mm-hmm. knowing it's temporary. So you need to trust people quickly. Mm-hmm. So we value that foundation a lot. Yep. Um, and that's just something I noticed as time went on. You know, the closest friends I have are the ones I trust the most. Oh, yeah, like, absolutely. Like, period. Like, mm-hmm. that's the ones that stand the test of time. Mm-hmm. All right. So question number two. Has there ever been – so the easy question would be like your favorite leader. Yeah. Um, was there ever a situation that really was tough to get through? Uh, you kind of felt like you were just banging your head on a wall, getting nowhere, question yourself. Mm-hmm. But it shaped you into who you are today for the better. Has there ever been a situation like that? Any situation or like a leadership? A, more of a leadership. More of a leadership. Mm-hmm. Or during your time in the service. Yeah. Um, so at my six year point in the air force, six or seven, I think, um, in 2014, I was probably in the best shape of my life at the peak of my career. I was leading an F-15 maintenance unit. We just came back from a deployment and we're ready to go out the door again. Um, and a few days before that TDY, I was going about my normal day and all of a sudden like my body kind of just just gave out. And by gave out I mean um the whole right side of my body just kind of like locked up, um started shaking a little bit. That had to have been like the weirdest feeling. It was feeling. the scariest feeling. Cuz your brain's telling your arm to move and it's it not. It is. It is not my my mind and my body were not in line. And I remember trying to call out for help. And again, like the words would not come out. It could not it, it form. It kind of sounds like a nightmare. Any words. It was very scary. Yeah. It was the scariest thing I've experienced. And that was when you were healthy and crushing it and feeling healthy good. Healthy and crushing it. Like it came out of nowhere. Okay, Just the rod so completely pulled out from under me. What what was the problem? What was happening? So I go to the emergency room after a good friend was like, that's, that's serious. You need to go now. <laughs> right. um, I'm glad you asked for a friend's advice because... Yeah, that yeah. that's uh, I would hate for you to ignore that, right? Yeah. So, yep. great friend, shout yes. out to a medic that helped you out. Yep, her name's Maria. <laughs> Maria, shout Maria, out to she, you. She helped, she helped me out. Um, but I went to the ER, and at this point, like I had full function again. So even the ER was like, "You're young and healthy. Like, what's going on?" And right, and I had to kind of tell them, like, "No, I've never experienced this. It was super scary." Um. So then they were like, okay, let's let's do some more, you know, in-depth look at what's happening. Okay. I go to get a CT scan. And I remember after my CT scan, um, being wheeled out of the room, the technician giving me this very, like, strange look. And I knew when he looked at me that so way, it was something So you saw the technician's serious. reaction. Yes. That's yep. not – because they're not supposed to tell no, you No, he didn't say anything. But they're educated enough to know – Yes. An anomaly. Yeah. So you're looking at his reaction. And he gave me a very like. Awkward look. Awkward look. Oh. Um, kind of like he, he feels a little sorry for you. Oh, no. Um, but you know he's holding back at the same time. That's not fun. No. And I, I knew instantly when I saw his face it wasn't going to be good news. But I didn't want to ask because I, I, I don't think he had a good poker face. <laughs> Is this um, a scan of your brain? It was a scan of my head. Yep. So that's even more. So it was even more alarming. Yeah. It was just a scan of my head. Oh, geez. Okay. Um, so then at one, when I go back to my room they had set up, um, a neurosurgeon walks in and he's like, you have a brain bleed. What? Yeah. I mean, I feel like the room was spinning, like completely spinning. Like you had an out of body, like. Out of body, like. This can't this be real. This can't be real. It's not making any sense. Like how. If I hear you know, brain bleed, I think it's like a really bad head injury. Is that. I mean, that as someone who doesn't study that at all. Yeah. Because I'm public health. Yeah. Um, you know, I hear brain bleed. I'm thinking, did you like fall down or what were you well, thinking? Well, he asked me. He's like, 
um, have you had any injuries, this or that? And I said, no. Um, and he's like, well, the brain bleed's coming from a tumor. Oh, it's my a God. brain tumor that hemorrhaged. And the tumor is located between your ears and behind your eyes. Okay, so like this is dead center. This is terrifying. Yeah. How do you even reach that? Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah, that's what you're thinking. That's what I'm thinking. Do like how that's in, that's like the center of your head. Yep. It's not like something external. Like you just, you know, this is like a dangerous place yeah. in your head. Yep. So when you heard that, you know, what, what um, kind of feelings, you know, did you have? Very, I was just scared. Like, what does this mean? Like all, all the questions, like, what does it mean? Is it cancerous? Um, how much time do I have? I'm here in Kadena, Japan. My family's back in the States. Like, I want, oh I want to talk gosh. to them first. Um, what does this mean about my career in the Air Force? Like, all these things are going through my mind. And I think the doctor at the time could see, like, I'm, I'm processing, right? Mm -hmm. So he didn't go into too much detail at the time. He, he did say that, like, we're going to have to do more scans, get better imaging, figure out what, what the next step is. I mean, you're probably worried about your career. Like, is this disqualifying? Like, mm -hmm. what does this mean for the rest of yeah. my future? But these, so these uh, physicians I was speaking to, the nurse, the doctor, they're all civilian. So they couldn't really That wasn't answer their the, no. concern at all. Not at, right? their, no, not okay. at that point. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. So, so I was admitted that night. Um, I, I was there for about a week. And over the week I did you know, a bunch of different labs, MRIs, more CT scans, um, a visual field acuity test. That's where they kind of test um, your vision. Because what they described too is this tumor was sitting like right on your optic nerves too. So and they're like, your vision might be impeded by yes, the pressure. They said like, if it grows anymore, if the blood moves, like you could be blind. So now I'm like terrified too that I, I may not ever be able to see again. Right. Oh mm -hmm. my gosh. That that's it's getting I'm I'm glad I'm sitting here talking yeah. to you now. Yeah. Right. And now now I'm at a point too where like I can talk about it and be comfortable talking about it, you know? Yeah, that you kind of start to own the story. Yeah. Um there's points in your life like let's say the first few times you went mm -hmm. to share that, you your brain just starts reliving it. Yeah. And it's very painful. Yes. And the more you share it, the more you kind of take ownership of it, mm -hmm. you know. I, I, so I know exactly the yeah. feeling yep. you're talking about. Because I just told you before we came in here, we kind of have that in common. Yeah. Where I almost passed away from the yeah yeah the myocarditis, mm -hmm. um, and then you know same same kind of situation. I go in there for. I'm just, you know, my chest hurts. I can't really breathe, but I'm young. So, yeah. what, you know, what could it really be? Yep. Asthma? I don't know. And then they're like, yeah, you need to go to Kansas City. Like, yeah. you have an anomaly on this EKG. And I'm like, what does that even mean? Yeah. Didn't pack anything. Just got sent straight to Kansas City. Mm -hmm. So, I, I am all too familiar with uh, that fear, yep. the questions. And then no one wants to tell you anything. Yeah. Right? No, you don't have any answers at all. Like, they're like, oh, that's not my lane. And it's like, well, whose is it? It's yep. like, oh, it's this one dude. You know, he comes in on Tuesday. You're like, yeah, so you got to wait till Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then students are coming by. You're like, yep. who are these people? Their students are talking to you. It's, yep. oh, it's rough. So, um, yeah, I mean, since we're on that, mm -hmm. um, you know, and it's been some time. Yeah. How did that play out? I ended up getting medevac from Kadena to join me, Lewis McCord, because they have a patient squadron. And so um, I went there. I was, sorry, I went from Kadena to Hickam okay. first to Tripler uh, Medical Center. Um, and in Tripler, I was being seen by an ophthalmologist for the eye vision, a neurosurgeon for potential COAs, and then an endocrinologist because it turned out to be my pituitary gland that the tumor was growing on. And so the pituitary gland controls all the hormones in your body. So it was like, okay, now we got to make sure your hormones and endocrine system are functioning the yeah, way like it should. Yeah, like what's your thyroid sitting at? All of it. Testosterone, so, estrogen. Yep. All that. Yeah. So it was like, I mean, I must have gotten pricked dozens of times. So you went every through every day, test in the every book. test. Um, and then the different options were laid out. Like we can do surgery, we can do like radio surgery. We point lasers at your head and try to, you know, shrink the tumor that way. 
We what? can do like, yeah, all these, all these different. None different of those options. sounds good no. or healthy. You no. know, what? you just reminded me of something that I don't think I've shared on any podcast. Mm -hmm. But because you're a maintenance officer, I think it's like very fitting. So when you're in that situation, yeah, you're a broken piece of equipment. Yeah, right. You're NMC. <laughs> <laughs> like they're troubleshooting your body. Yep. Is that not weird? Yep. Like the the same approach that we have to like the age equipment. Yep. You you look at the diagrams, you start with the easy stuff, you're running the test, you're troubleshooting yeah. it, you're trying to narrow it down, narrow it down. I never thought in a million years that like medically that would happen to a human. But yeah. when you're in that scenario, that is exactly what they're doing. That's exactly what they're doing. Yeah. They're troubleshooting mm -hmm. your body. Yep. Is that not weird? It was weird. It's an odd feeling. And there's no guarantees and everything has its risks. Right. And so you're still like trying to figure out what the right course for you is, mm -hmm. you know. Um, at the same time, I was going through a med board and thankfully I was retained and that was based on some really good leadership I had back at Kadena who just fought for me and said, you know, she's she's who we need. Let's see this through. Let's see what happens. Right. Um, but they did say, you're not going back overseas. And so that's where I went from Hickam to Lewis McCord. What about all your stuff? So I had to have, I had to do a POA, send it to someone. No. To, back at Kadena. Yep. I had to send it to some friends and they had to pack up all my house, deal with like the landlord, you know, turning the phone off, all that stuff. Like, so like the Air Force refused to send me back. Oh they gosh. said, you're going to have to figure out another way to, to get your stuff figured out. <laughs> so you out processed and moved, but you weren't physically there. No, it was a really great team back at Kadena that was doing it all for me. Well, they really did support you because like, yeah. not only did they go to bat for you, but you know, the <laughs> admin work to help you stay stateside mm -hmm. was probably tremendous yeah and i always say like the best you know how we we go for bullets oh that's a good bullet blah, blah. Mm -hmm. but uh, i've always noticed the best bullets aren't aren't bullets it's just being a good yeah. human yeah it's stuff like that that experience just seeing the team rally around me yeah um from finance they you know there was a period of time where i had to get a new place in washington state but i had my old place in japan and they produce some kind of memo to make sure I got BAH for both periods of time until I can get my stuff moved out of Kadena. Um, so from the finance team to the maintenance squadron, the fighter squadron I was paired with, like they all rallied and just made sure I was cared for, my things were taken care of. Like that's one thing that Air Force gets right. Like truly it was, it was amazing to see how the whole team just came together to support me. Yeah, I mean that that just probably filled you with like love, you know. So what I mean? much, yeah, so much gratitude, so much love. Yeah, I mean you're in the most vulnerable state you've ever been in, probably mm -hmm. in your life. Yeah, where your well being, your fate is all in these peers' hands, mm -hmm. right? Your coworkers. Yep. Um, and to see them, to know they have your back, like for real. Yeah, for real. Like, I mean, it really changes your life mm -hmm. to see it play out. Yeah. Right. Yep. So, you know, I guess my, my third question on the random questions, yeah. and and then we'll get more into like the paper. Yeah. Uh, since we're, this is centered around it, <laughs> uh, or the article. Um, you know, for that experience, you know, that it, you basically had a, a traumatic experience where you almost lost your life. Your mm -hmm. fate, you, those thoughts were there. Yep. Right. Um, how has that changed you leading a squadron, leading airmen, you mm -hmm. know, leading yourself, your family? How has that changed? your perspective on your approach to life. Yeah. Um, so during that period of time, just weighing like what the future could look like, potentially no future. Um, I experienced some of my darkest days. Just, I just remember feeling so much depression and despair. Um, just navigating this medical journey. Every day was different. Every day came with its own physical challenges, but from the outside, you couldn't tell, right? Like my tumor was in my head. I looked healthy. I looked young. I looked vibrant. And so that whole experience just really taught me a few things. Um, one was just gratitude for everything life has to offer. And life is too short to really worry about the things that don't matter. Mm -hmm. And then when I view people or come across different people, whether it's a small hello or sitting down to give someone career advice or feedback, I remember that they're probably all carrying their own burdens 
um, their own stories, their own trials and dark days as well, but you can't see it from the outside. Right. So it's just a good reminder to to show grace, show kindness, and remember that everyone's going through something. I think I, I carry that with me every day and all of my interactions with airmen is that um, show them the grace that you'd been to be shown. Um, show them compassion. And I tell all my folks here too, like even when you're holding people accountable, you can still show compassion. You can do both things. Right. I don't want people to inflate compassion as um, being soft and like doing whatever you want. It's different. It's trying to put yourself in their shoes and leading that way. It's kind of like if like your brother or sister or something, yeah, you know, mm-hmm. messed up and needed help. Like you would approach, you wouldn't come at them and with just all like, oh, you broke this rule and this. Like you would, you would come at them different, right? Like you would, yep. you want them to succeed ultimately, yep. right? Yeah. With so with that in mind and that on your heart, I think that absolutely would change your approach, the way you speak mm-hmm. with folks, um, and. Uh, you know, leading like that, you catch a lot of things too. Yeah. I noticed people come to you with things that yeah. you're like, whoa, I could have missed that completely. But yeah. you created a space where they're able to, to tell you the truth mm-hmm. about something they're dealing with. Yeah. I know and you've probably had close calls like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's nice where people feel like they can trust me with the burdens they carry too. Uh, that experience told me too, like, it's better to share your burdens. Cause I, I was the type two who just shoulder everything. Like I didn't like asking for help. I didn't like asking for support, but realizing that people want to show support and they want to help. I tried to exude that too with my team here and let them know, like it's okay to ask for help and you have a whole team of people ready to help, you know, just let us know. And we mean it. Absolutely. And when you said you were in that really dark time, Mm -hmm. I'm sure you felt isolated, Mm -hmm. um, which always makes things worse. Um, Was there there anything, because we all come to a point in our life, or or hopefully we come to the point where we decide, you know, I'm going to change how I approach this, or I'm going to change how I see this now. Mm -hmm. And so at one point you made that choice. Mm -hmm. What was that point? I decided to just keep going. Like I decided to not stand still. Um, I decided that this can also be looked at as an opportunity. Like what am I supposed to, I do believe everything happens for a reason. So I had lots of time to do that Mm self-reflection and eventually you get tired of feeling tired. So I decided like, what am I supposed to learn from this? Why is this part of my journey? Why is this my story? Um, am I meant to use my story to help others during their trying times? So I had those recurring conversations with myself and spent time just reflecting. And um, that ended up being like what I needed to pull myself out of that too. Right. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. Yes. I, I don't share that with more, many people. So <laughs> I probably well, now you shared it with a lot. I did. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just me sitting here. It's like yeah. tens of thousands of people, yeah. which, uh, you know, I love that you're doing that because I mean, you, you're, I mean, you're a great leader and the way you share your story, I, I is it's, it's special the way that you've owned it. Um, and you're leveraging it for a greater good. Mm-hmm. You know, that's an inspiring thing to see. So I, uh, I'm very thankful that you're sharing that with us today. I appreciate that so much. Okay, so we have an article here, and we're going to release the episode in conjunction with this article. So mm-hmm. could you tell us a little bit about, you know, who asked you to write this and, and where they can read it? Yes. So um, currently at Fairchild in Spokane, Washington, and one of our um, community leaders, she's actually an AMC civic leader, um, she is running a pretty new magazine publication and it's to spotlight and highlight different people in the community that are out doing good things. And her vision is to inspire youth. Uh, Her vision is to motivate and encourage people who feel like, you know, there are barriers or they can't reach their goals to just share like everyday people who have probably have some commonalities with them that were able to, um, to do some things that, you know, we initially thought were impossible or we didn't have the potential to do. So that's her vision for it. And so she asked me for their upcoming Juneteenth 
um, July 4th edition to kind of share what Juneteenth means to me and then just share my story, like where I came from, um, be a representation to others who feel like, you know, they might come from the same walk of life and that mm -hmm. they can, they too can, can do big things and go after what they want. So that's where this came from. So let's talk about Juneteenth and what it means to you. Cause I, I mean, it, it, it's something close to your heart. You're supporting mm -hmm. it through this really well thought out article on your life. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, as you were writing that, you know, what, why was Juneteenth uh, such a heavy concept on your heart and on your mind as you navigated this article? Um, I don't think a lot of people understand the importance of Juneteenth. Um, so Juneteenth commemorates when people in Galveston, Texas were formally informed about the Emancipation Procl Proclamation, mm -hmm. and it took about two years for that news to reach him. And so that delay in informing them, it just demonstrates the oppression at the time and the barriers to getting that news of freedom right. um, to people who are marginalized. And since then, African-American communities have celebrated that time um, of when they actually got their freedom. It's become a celebration in different communities um, through speeches and rallies and just celebrations in their local towns and communities. But I feel like a lot of people feel like it's only something that the African American community can or should celebrate when it's really about all of our shared history in America. It's a part of American history. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of themes we can draw out um, that should resonate with all of us as Americans. You know, our pursuit for liberty, our pursuit for happiness, our pursuit for freedom. That's what Juneteenth's about. And it's about recognizing the struggles of the African-American journey in America, the progress we've made, and then how, like, where we are now as a society. Right. It's been a lot of, like, amazing progress. Recognizing there's still some progress to be made mm -hmm. and that there's still hate to overcome. It should still be celebrated that as a country, we've united around these ideals that have formed our nation um, Juneteenth celebrates those ideals. So that's why it means a lot to me as, as an American and um, just recognizing our journey, you know. Mm -hmm. It's about being informed citizens and understanding our past so that we can make a brighter future. Absolutely. And, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, I I got really involved with um, DE&I co uh, committee at our med group. Mm -hmm. um, and... Yeah, nothing, I, I don't think anything gave me a such a a love in my heart than hearing people's stories yeah. at those meetings. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, like, it really does, it, it's meant to bring people together, mm -hmm. right? It's meant to have a conversation, get a new perspective, understand that person, yep. and then realize that that diversity and that unique collection of folks that we have is actually is like our biggest strength mm -hmm. right like that's why we're doing well yeah because we have folks from all over with all different perspectives different ideas and uh collectively that's a really powerful thing absolutely so i i uh i'm a i'm a big fan of of juneteenth i learned about it through being that exec i told you about mm -hmm. when i worked for colonel uh crystal henderson yeah who made uh she she led a bunch of really impactful juneteenth events um and it was uh that's kind of when my eyes started opening and i started yeah. opening my heart and and it, and it really filled me with with love and peace honestly and connection with people yeah um once i allowed those conversations to happen so mm -hmm. I, I love that you're doing that um yeah and you know as you uh you know were writing this is there any part of you that has has worried or worries that maybe people misconstrue like Juneteenth and, and that's important for you to educate folks on what it really means? I think, I think so. Um, I think some people see it as divisive. Like we already have July 4th. Why do we need Juneteenth if we're all one country? Um, but I think again, they're missing where Juneteenth came from and Right. It's important to know the it's origin. It's important to know the origin. And it's a, it's sad. It's yeah, sad that it that is. happened to them. Mm -hmm. 
right? And so it's also honoring that, you know, yeah. their plight, yep. what they had to deal with. And I don't think you should pick and choose what part of American history, you know, should be reviewed and celebrated and reflected on, you know. I think if you know July 4th, you should know Juneteenth, right? Those are both pivotal parts in our history um, and our pursuit for freedom, freedom for all, you know? Right. So It's meant to bring us together. It's meant to bring us together. And I think it also demonstrates that, yeah, we're all different. We have different backgrounds, maybe religious beliefs, maybe the relationships we, we cherish are different, or um, maybe we just look different, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. But despite our differences, we have way more in common than we think. Absolutely. We're all still human. Absolutely. Yep. <laughs> um, and, and no, yeah. As soon as you, you know, for some people, it's harder than others mm -hmm. to have those talks. Um, and some people have a misconstrued perception of, of what the point of it is. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. you know, I encourage anyone to at least try, at least, and, and anyone that shows up to stuff like that just because they're curious, like I have a high respect for, because you yeah. should at least try and put yourself out there and really learn um, who your teammates are. Yep. You know, the people that you call family uh, being in the service um, to learn what's important to them. And the, the trust um, that I've seen that build is beyond measure. I encourage that too. Like you, you find out so many like, unique really cool things about people that you would have never known had you not broached that conversation absolutely yeah. that's awesome and i know this article is going to be you know by the time it comes out you know <laughs> um because you know at this point when people are listening to this it is out yeah but i know it's gonna resonate and touch so many lives you you put a lot of work into i appreciate that because I'm a, I'm a storyteller so i yeah. know a story you know when i see it and yeah. You've come at so many different angles in here. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the last things I, I do want to talk to you about, though, is you have a very um, unique upbringing and mm -hmm. ethnicity that, you know, is, uh, is rare, right? Mm -hmm. You're, uh, you, you came up not looking like everyone around you. Yeah. I was hoping you could talk to us about, you know, what your childhood was like and then kind of what those feelings were. You know, because that's when you first notice it, right? Yeah. If you notice when kids are real young, like they don't notice differences. They mm -hmm. just know they're all kids. Yeah. At some point, social society mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, nature versus nurture kind of thing, the outside world starts kind of, they start kind of picking up on things. Mm -hmm. And you start learning about yourself and how people perceive you. Yeah. And that can be enlightening. That, and that could also be traumatic. Mm -hmm. You know, um, my wife talks about being Filipino in Missouri yeah, and like being the only one like that and, and how that was, that was tough. Like her, the standard of beauty and, yeah. you know, you know, that, that was a hard thing for her to navigate. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was hoping you could kind of dive into, to that with, with growing up with yeah. that and, and talk about your background. Yeah. So as I briefly mentioned in the beginning, um, my dad is African American and my mom is Korean. Um, they met during one of his TDYs to Korea and came back to the States. It was love at first sight. It was. It was. Yeah. I mean, um, there was a language barrier, but there was they clicked despite the language barrier. You know, love transcends any language barrier. Yep. I mean, honestly, it does. Yeah. That, you, like, if, if that's guiding, you know, mm -hmm. your thoughts and actions, the connection will find a way. Yep. Yeah. So sounds and like they've that's been what married um, since, gosh, I want to say 1983. No way. Yeah. I was yep. born in 84. Yeah. So it's, it's older than me. It's a very long wow, time. Yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I grew up hearing some of their stories and witnessing their relationship. And sometimes I met witnessing the prejudice that they experience as well. But so I grew up in an African American and a Korean home, and so that meant a lot of just um, cultural differences. You know, celebrating like the Lunar New Year, what we call Chuseok in Korean, um, celebrating Juneteenth, growing up with different values like taking your shoes off in the home. You know, um, yeah. Come to think of it, you have your perspective was. <laughs> You had a, a actually a, a much wider 
perspective with mm-hmm. the, with two different cultures. Yeah. Then mo- that which which can be tough when when your scope is this big and then some people's scope is this big. Yep. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but I I notice the difference of you know my rituals and customs versus my peers who are predominantly you know white girls and boys. Um, I noticed a difference at a young age, and I I remember some of that was like a celebration of me just being proud of where I come from, but also sometimes it was challenging, you know, and feeling embarrassed sometimes, like embarrassed of the food I'm bringing into school, um, embarrassed of, you know, maybe it's the language my mom is speaking around at school, Korean language. Um, or br- just bringing your parents together. Maybe they've never bringing seen Bringing my that, parents right? together. Um I remember feeling embarrassed and I remember it, a lot of, I didn't know to feel embarrassed until I got, you know, some of the different reactions, like your food smells, what is that, you know? Mm. Um, and it's surprising that you do get that at a young age. Like and, that and stayed with that's me. That's painful. Yeah. Because at, at that point in your life, that's your whole world. Yeah. Right? Yep. Like you're not some mature grown adult that no. can compare it to the other, like, at and that this, moment, that is that's your my world, world. and so, that's and to me, that food is the food my mom made with love. Right. And so now you're telling me there's something wrong with it. So mm-hmm. I have memories like that 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 have stuck with me. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also made me into the person I am today. Knowing like words matter. Knowing that um, just because we're different doesn't make either bad. It's just we're different. Um, right. and that there's a lot to gain from our different backgrounds and stories. So I grew up, yeah, um, in a very different household. And I think a lot of that carried her on, carried on, not just through grade school, but in college too. You know, I went to a very predominantly white private school in Oregon. Um, you had, a, you had a, a scholarship to that school, correct? I did. Yeah. With that, and that wasn't just purely from academics. That was purely from academics. Not yeah. a sport or something. Nope. You're very smart. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> like that's crazy hard yeah. to do. Yeah. Um. So you you're basically around a bunch of rich kids that whose parents paid for them to be there. Whereas, mm-hmm. so you were in a completely different environment yeah. with different people who had a way different childhood than mm-hmm. you. So I, I could imagine. That was challenging. That was challenging. Um, a lot of people I met came from predominantly very wealthy areas of California. Um, you know, they went, they grew up going to private school their whole lives. And just looking around the room, I was the only one that looked like me. More so than my experience in grade school and high school. I felt very out of place and I felt like... That's how you, I mean, I could see you feeling get that imposter syndrome. Yes. Maybe questioning your self-worth. Yes. Your capability. Am I supposed to be here? Because <laughs> if you see what was considered successful and you can't relate with the picture of what they're saying is successful, mm-hmm. you know, that's that's a painful thing to try yeah. to navigate. Yeah. And at this point in my life, too, I hadn't really seen any examples close to me as far as um, women or minorities mm-hmm. in positions of authority or influential positions or positions where they're making decisions. I haven't personally seen that. Um, So I feel like I was kind of creating my own path without really knowing where it's going to lead me. Do you think that made you stronger or did that put doubt in you? Um, I think it was ebbs and flows of both, you know, and I do think, and the moments of when I was doubted, I lean back on my upbringing and my my mom and dad, right? Um, so they they really ingrained in me that there's no dream too big, there's no obstacle too big, that you can do whatever you want to do if you work hard, um, if you focus on your studies, you can do it. And I think those words, like just I would just replay those words, and I would look at them as an example too Uh, yeah no that's beautiful i mean having your parents as role models is a blessing Mm -hmm. you know um Mm -hmm. and my dad was in the military and you know he was my guiding light my role model uh, my foundation Mm -hmm. the only constant i had so i 
you know, I have that in common with you too. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I really value and cherish that I, I'm blessed to have my parents guide me that way. Yeah. You know, yep. I'm so fortunate for that. And now we get to do it for our kids. Yeah. Like it, it's, you're kind of raising yourself. Mm -hmm. Like there are many versions of you, right. In yep. a way. And you're able to like catch things that went wrong or mm -hmm. a perception or a situation. And you're kind of able to like intervene. It's like helping yourself in the past. Yeah. That's how it feels to yeah. me. It's just I mean, a wild concept. I love that you say that to you because the school lunch thing, <laughs> it kind of came full circle a year ago. No. So my daughter started kindergarten and I met some really great mom friends through her class. And um, one of the other moms was so distraught because she said her son came home saying like, he never wants to bring his Mexican food to school. Which is a heartbreaking thing as a parent to hear. She was just heartbroken. She's like, he loves my food. Like, and she would get up early and make like the most amazing dishes, make them from love. You know, it was her expression of love to him, right? So and that really hurt. She was so hurt and she was just going to let it go. And I was like, absolutely not. Oh, snap. Like, I live this. You're not letting it go. <laughs> We're talking to the teacher about it. Um, oh, wow. So, it, like, you had an opportunity to yeah. correct the the pain that you had as a child. You had an yes. opportunity to intervene and and, yeah. and right that wrong. Yeah. And that's I, a pretty I was powerful a, thing. And it happened in kindergarten, you know. Wow, that's brutal. Yeah. Kindergarten. Kindergarten, where kids were making fun of him for the food he was breaking, his ethnic food. And so we t I talked to the teacher, and I knew they had a conversation because a few days later, my daughter came home from school and said, hey, we learned that there's lots of different foods, and if we don't like it, it's okay if the other person likes it. So I, it was good to see that they had that conversation, that an adult intervened with the whole class, let them know it's not okay to make fun of the differences in people's customs, traditions, something as simple as the food they're eating. Yeah, it's, that's why, I've, you know, well, for one, you're also missing out on great food. Yeah, that's what <laughs> I, I'm saying. Like, who doesn't want these enchiladas for lunch? <laughs> right, like every culture has like their staple mm -hmm. that it, and, and they're all incredible, right? Yeah. Curry, sushi, like they're yep. all so good. Um, and so, you know, I, I, uh, I think it's so important raising your kids – Really, I see it as them not being selfish or narcissistic, or yeah. I, I, I want them to know Just like kind, good human beings. Right, like there's other people other than you out there. Yep. Right. It's it's not all about you. Yes. And and really giving them that that perspective, which I'm already seeing my daughter become seriously empathetic and yeah, and show emotional range that like I never had as a kid, and it's it's really heartwarming to know that like I'm raising this little person to, to I love have that. so much love in her heart. Yeah. You know? And that's what you want. Yeah. You want your kids to go out in the world and um, be good citizens, help others, make the community better. Definitely. Yeah. Then you're about to make me cry. Oh my goodness. <laughs> mm. Dang. Start talking about my kids. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, well, we, we went over a lot of deep topics today. Yeah. Like it's already 50 minutes and I feel like I've been talking to you for like 10 minutes. <laughs> I could talk to you all day. We could talk all day. We could talk all day. <laughs> um, but uh, I did want to really give you a shout out of how awesome you are. Um, just hearing your story, reading this article, seeing you interact, you know, with the airmen, with Ronnie's retirement. Um, I could say I've never met an, a maintenance officer like you. And I say that in a good way. Yeah. I think you're exceptional. Um, and, you know, I'm retiring soon too. I'm right behind Ronnie. And, you know, it gives me a lot of faith knowing that someone like you is watching over them when I leave. So I just want to thank you for for showing up for, first of all, first yourself, right? Because you have to, you got to show up for yourself first. Mm -hmm. And then now you're using that to show up for others. Yeah. So I just want to thank you so much I... and then uh, kind of leave it to you if you have any final thoughts you'd like to share. Yeah, I just want to say um, I really... I really appreciate your kind words. Um, it means a lot. Command, like being in command, can be really just exhausting some days. Mm -hmm. um, it can really make you doubt and question, like what you're doing and if you're charting the right path for the whole squadron. Like it can be, it can be very it's, stressful. It's isolating. Some days. It's lonely at the top. They, yeah. it, that there's not that doesn't ring more true than yep. being a commander. Um, that is a uh, that is 
you know, I think the chief of staff, General Goldfinger, said that is the most important and the mm-hmm. most challenging Air Force job. It, there it is. is it, it's very challenging, but it's also very rewarding. It's fulfilling seeing um, the airmen you care for and raise go out and do big things, reach their goals, um, learn like truly how capable they are, um, where they can tap into their own strengths. Like that's that's rewarding, and it, and it's also reaffirming hearing words like yours when when airmen come and say thank you, when they recognize your hard work, um, when they see your vision. And that it's for the betterment of of the unit and everyone. Like that means a lot to me. So, thank you, thank you, thank you for your kind words. Like, there's not a commander I know that you know couldn't use more encouraging words. Right, y'all. It's okay um, to <laughs> it's okay to compliment your boss. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I learned that as an exec. Yeah. I learned, uh, you know, it, it's it means a lot. Still, like mm-hmm. you, a lot of folks assume you're 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 highly successful. You're busy, and maybe you wouldn't. But we're humans too. You're still you're <laughs> still going to really appreciate yeah. the positive feedback. You know yep. what I mean? Yep. Um, and so I, I love that I was able to take some time, and Ronnie could take some time and really let you know the kick-ass person that you really are. I appreciate that so much. Absolutely. Uh-huh. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. This was the hero's journey of Lieutenant Colonel Abigail Curtis. And we're out.